All right, no further ado, let's get to the Word of God here this morning because I'm talking about something that we can all relate to, and that's the changes in life that we experience. Have you ever woken up in the morning and, like, that day nothing went right? I mean, like, absolutely nothing went right. You come to the end of the day, you're thinking, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, I, I wish that uh, I wouldn't even got out of bed this morning. Uh, go ahead, get on that slide. I'm off on the wrong slide here. Um, you know, it, 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 maybe you've had a day like that where you just, you wonder, why did you get out of bed? Maybe you had a week like that. Maybe you had a month like that. Why not, we say, all of 2020? We just wish we'd go to sleep and wake up and it would all be different. Well, you, you know, if that's, if anything has changed in 2020 for you, guess what? This is a great Sunday that you picked to come to church or to tune in because we're going to talk about what to do when things go wrong, but more specifically, what to do when God changes your plans. Really, that's the Christmas story because all the, the cast of characters in the Christmas story, their plans changed dramatically. Nobody's life turned out like they had planned, like they had hoped, maybe even like they had dreamed. I want you to think of Mary and Joseph. They were just a young couple, getting ready to get married. All they wanted was a simple life to, you know, have children, make a home, raise a family in this little Middle Eastern town in Israel, and they just wanted a simple life. All of a sudden, God shows up in the form of an angel and says, wait a minute, I know you got these plans, but God wants to do something different in your life. Guess what, Mary? We'll start with you. We'll get to Joseph later, but Mary, little sweet little Mary, guess what? You're going to get pregnant before the wedding. That's right, before the wedding. And guess what? The dad of your child isn't even going to be Joseph, as handsome and rugged as he is, no, it's going to be God. Yeah, you're going to be carrying God's son. How many know that that change in plans was pretty dramatic? See, God changed their plans, didn't he? How about Herod? Herod was a king of, of Judea, appointed by the Roman Empire. But he was such a paranoid control freak that he always felt threatened. His throne was threatened because, thre threatened because, you know, he wasn't even Jewish, and yet he was uh, ruling over Jewish people. So he always felt really paranoid about his rulership. Um, and so he was so paranoid that to protect his throne, he killed everybody around him, everybody close around him. L listen to this list of people that King Herod killed. He killed his wife. He killed his own mother. He killed his brother-in-law. He even killed two of his own sons. Come on, he was more than paranoid. He was demon-possessed. And then he heard a rumor that the king of the Jews was born in Bethlehem, so he sent a regiment of soldiers, and he decreed that every child under two years old will be killed, and it was so. I mean, talk about a change in plans. How about... The religious leaders, their plans changed. They were praying for a Messiah. They were praying for the anointed one, the Savior of the world. But in actuality, they wanted a political Savior. They wanted to be saved from the Roman Empire. And then when Jesus showed up, of course, he grew up, and then he started teaching. And out of his mouth started things like this. We're to love our enemies. We're to be good to those who persecute us. We're to treat others uh, and love others as we love ourselves. See, the Messiah that came was not the Messiah that they had planned for. How about the innkeeper? He didn't plan on that big crowd because masses came to that town of Bethlehem to take the census, and, and so he didn't have room for this young couple uh, when she's pregnant, and about ready to deliver. They did, he didn't have room, so he put them in a stable with all the animals because there was no room in the inn. Their, that innkeeper's plans changed. How about the shepherds out in that beautiful outside of Bethlehem, that, 
starry night. It was, it was filled. It was beautiful. They're just chilling. They're just, you know, chillaxing and just having, having fun out there with their sheep. I don't know if they're having fun, but they're doing their job. And all of a sudden, in the, the, the starry night, a light flashed and an angelic voice came from heaven and said, you better go to Bethlehem because unto us a child has been born. You see, plans do change, not only in Bible times, but in our times. And let me be clear, though. I'll get, I'll get back to that one. Let me be clear that not everything that happens in our life, though, is God's will. Not everything that happens is God's will. A lot of the problems that we face, sometimes we bring on ourselves because of our dumb decisions, our stupid mistakes. Uh, things come out of our mouth that have little to do with, with God. Sometimes other people's dysfunction causes problems in our life. And we experience things, we go through things. Um, and it's because we live in a broken world with imperfect people, broken people. And so we've all sinned, and there's people that we've hurt intentionally and even unintentionally. There's people who have hurt you intentionally and unintentionally because it's part of the world that we live in. Rape is not God's will. Being molested is not God's will. A being abused is not God's will. Prejudice is not God's will. Oh, we could go on. Cancer, Alzheimer's is not part of God's will. All the evil things that you can think of, it's not always God's will. That's why Jesus told us to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because the perfect will of God is being enacted in heaven, but not so much in earth. We live in a, in a fallen world. And so we're told to pray, God, you know, let your kingdom, your perfect kingdom on heaven be expanded here on earth. And so, you know, and it's almost never done on earth, is it, right? God gave us free will. And oftentimes, we choose our will over his will. And so we don't blame God for all the evil things around us. As a believers, we don't blame God for everything. It would be an easy out, easy excuse. But see, it's not because of his will. It's because of our rebellious will. And sometimes God intervenes. When his followers pray, when they have faith to believe for a, a, an in intervention, or maybe sometimes God intervenes just because it's his sovereign will, he's God, and he doesn't have to explain everything to us little people here because he's a sovereign God. Okay, and so, but sometimes he intervenes and he taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, listen, I know you got your own plans, but guess what? I've I want to do something special in your life. And for me to do something special in your life, guess what? i got to change some of your plans. In fact, look at this verse of Scripture. Sorry. Here we go. Proverbs 19. You can make many plans, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. So we have a lot of plans, don't we? And sometimes our plans don't line up with God's plans, and he Taps us on the shoulder and says, listen, i got some great things I want to do for you. So if you find yourself with things changing, and uh, maybe, just maybe, it's God's purpose being enacted in your life. So what do you do when God changes your plans? I want you to remember these three things here this morning. First thing that you do when God changes your plans is this. Understand that he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to get your attention. You may be going down the wrong road, and, and God's like, wait a minute, you, before you take another step, let me, let me talk to you a little bit. Let me guide you a little bit. You, you've done that before. You see, see somebody making a mistake, like, you, know, you should really consider this consequence before you make this decision. Oftentimes, God, he wants our attention, and uh, in the case of Mary and Joseph, he had, it was such an incredible, unbelievably, ridiculously out of the ordinary plan that God had to do something extraordinary to get their attention in the form of an angel. So he sends an angel. Now, God may not send an angel to you to get your attention. Now, 
In the New Testament, it says we're to entertain angels unaware. I believe that it's going to happen more and more as we come further and further along in the last of these last days. But, you know, in, in many cases, he's not going to send an angel to you. we got enough problems to worry about, like learning how just to listen to God. <laughs> That's maybe the biggest challenge of all. Listening to God, because most of us were not very good listeners, especially when it comes to hearing the voice of God and to understanding what God's will and how, what he wants to do in our lives. M- mainly because we're so distracted, we, uh, we're listening to everything else and everybody else, and sometimes it's very hard to hear the voice of God. Maybe it's because we're talking all the time. We're on our device. We're listening to the radio, to the TV. We got our playlist going, and we, we fail to listen to God. People sometimes say, you know, I never hear God speak. Maybe, maybe it's because there's no broadband left. Your lines are jammed. Maybe God's getting the busy signal. Have you ever just sat down without you with your phone a ways away from you, maybe even turned off, not even a Bible or a book with you, no music playing, and you, have you ever sat down and just simply asked, God, what do you want to say to me today? Whew. Being left alone, you thought, some of you are like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, we've been trained to need external stimuli just to be able to sometimes get through life and just to not get off on that emotional detour that sometimes can take us for a ride, right? We've trained ourselves to be so distracted. God wants your attention. And sometimes he has to change your plans to get your attention. Look what Psalm 81 13 says, oh, that my people would listen to me. That's from the heart of God. Some of you are like, no, that's from the heart of me. I'm a parent. (laughs) I'm constantly like, oh, would my people, would my family, would my kids, my teenager, would my parents please listen to me? Some of you, you're longing for that attention from your husband or from your wife. You're longing to be heard in your family as a teenager. Mom and Dad, would you listen to me? Or at school or at work. You got some great ideas, but nobody ever listens to you. And so, you know, man, you have a perspective that could really take the company uh, further down the road, and yet, you know, nobody's listening to you. I mean, that's the cry of all of our heart. Well, we have to ask, why does God want our attention? Why does he want us to listen to him? Why? Why? Simply this, to save us from a lot of problems. He sees the future. We don't. So he wants to save us from a lot of pain, from a lot of stuff, to save us from our problems. Some of the worst decisions I made is when I got way out in front of my skis. I thought it was a good idea. I got the cart before the horse, and maybe I I didn't listen to godly counsel around me. Maybe I didn't listen to my wife, who doubles as the Holy Spirit for me. (laughs) That, those are big shoes to fill, honey. <laughs> really? It's because I just I wasn't listening to God. I was listening to others. I was listening to myself. I, well, who knows? But I wasn't listening to God. You see, here's another great verse in Proverbs 14. There's a path before each of us that seems right, but it ends in death. It ends on a dead, dead end road. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes my seamer is off. My seamer is isn't right. Well, it seemed like a good idea to make that investment. It seemed like a good idea to, you know, go out with him. It seemed like a good idea to marry her. It seemed like a good idea to go to that college. It seemed like a good idea to start that business. Sometimes our seamers off. It seems right to us, but you see, God has a perspective that we don't have. He sees the future. And uh, sometimes we we not only tune God out, but sometimes we tune out the community of believers that he's put us in, that we belong to. I don't mean just attend. I mean like you belong. If your church experience is just coming whenever you can on a Sunday, you're missing out on the most important things of what a church family is. A church family, really, to be experienced is not just putting in an hour on a Sunday. It's about going to uh, Dover to help New Life for Girls yesterday with some of the repairs around there. It's about helping somebody yesterday who needed help uh, to move and just showing up and being available to be there. 
I mean, there's a thousand ways that, that that's how you get connected. I've had people come through this church and be here for years, and they come up to me and say, you know, I still don't know where I fit in. I don't, I don't feel like I belong. And part of me is I try to be kind and gentle and sensitive, but I just say, what's the problem with you? we got so many opportunities here for you to connect and for you to belong, for you to grow. What is it that's stopping you? Maybe it's not this church. Maybe it's not other things or other people. Maybe there's something that you need to address. Maybe you've got your own walls up. I don't know what it is. But man, we need the community of believers because that helps we gain perspective from their wisdom and their experience. You see, God's perspective is something we don't have. He knows what's going to happen in 2021. We don't, but he does. He sees the big picture. Look what Isaiah says in, uh, well, and we have a limited perspective. So here's what Isaiah says. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. Think about that. And then he goes on to say, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that thinks higher and lives higher than, than we do? Man, if it was all up the way I think, oh, my goodness, you know, it, we'd all be in trouble, right? Or how you think. Man, I'm glad God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. You see, God has a better perspective, and we have a limited perspective. It's kind of like when you're parenting your children, you have a perspective that they don't have. You say to them, kids, you can see the stove. It's glowing red. It looks really cool to touch, but it's not really cool. It's hot. Now, he doesn't, they don't say, don't touch that because they're mean or they don't like you or they hate you. No. They know because of their experience that that's not a good thing. It's going to harm you, but it's because they love you. And so God says in his word, look at, I've got so many things. I, 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 I want to help you with, the, with your thought life, what to think. I want to help you with what direction to go in life, what your purpose is in life. There's a lot of things I want to help you to know what to do, and there's some things I don't, I, I, I don't want you to do because from a parent's perspective, a heavenly father, I know that they're bad for you. But oftentimes, we just ignore what God has said. We think we know better than God. We think we know what will make us happy. And so we just kind of, you know, rebel against what God says in his word. Oh, don't be unequally yoked. Well, but I really like him. I like her. Even though he or she doesn't even believe in God or doesn't have some of the same spiritual values as you. I mean, some of us give, give a testimony of marrying somebody who... You know, maybe they're going to church alone today because their husband or their wife or their family isn't even interested anymore. God said, don't be unequally yoked. Or he says, don't carry unforgiveness with you. But some of us like, I, I'm not forgiving her. I'm not going to forgive him. They did me wrong. The ball's in their court. I'll take a step once they take a, take a step. And so we carry all that bitterness and resentment. And the Bible says you will defile yourself. That thing that's ugly in your life, guess what? It's going to make you ugly. So don't carry it. But yet, we think that we can do that. Or worry. Worry is a sin. Let's call it what it is. Worry is a sin. And yet some of us, you know, we just fill ourselves with so much anxiety and so much worry, and, and we're not trusting God the way uh, we need to. And there's more to, that will be said about that, but it's not just something easy like that. I know some people really deal with very some difficulties and struggles in that area. But you see, there's things that God tries to help us with in his word, but you know, we think we seem to, to know better than he does. And so God, as a good father, he's like, you know, I, I don't want you to get burned. I don't want you to live with broken lives and a, a broken body and a broken marriage and broken dreams. I tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Let's make a deal. It says, I'll exchange all the heartache and all the stress that you're carrying if you give me some of your attention. Because when God changes your plan, guess what? He's trying to get your attention. The second thing that he's trying to do is this. It means that he's trying to get a better plan to you because God has a better plan. Here's a breaking news. Here's a news alert happening now. God has a better plan Amen. than yours. Hallelujah. A verse that we love to quote this time of year, beginning of the year for sure, is this one. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Oh, we love to claim that promise. And it's true, God has good plans for you. He really does. But he's not going to force his plans on you. You have to be willing. He gives you the choice. So you can either keep going with your little plan or you can understand that God has a better plan. And the thing about God's plan for your life, guess what? It's better, but it's also bigger. God's plan for you is bigger. For Mary and Joseph, it was much bigger than the simple life that they wanted to have. God came along and said, no, I'm going to make you a couple that's going to influence the world. It was a plan bigger than they could ever imagine. God's plan for you is bigger than you could ever imagine. It really is. And, you know, that's why maybe you can't imagine it because, you know, we deal with our flaws and we deal with other people's flaws and sometimes we can't advance as far as, you know, we do. Maybe we're telling ourselves our own lies and, or maybe somebody else has been down on us. But guess what? God's plan for you are bigger because everything about God is about increase. It's about increase. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why Jesus said, greater things will you do than I have done. It's about increase. That's why when you plant one apple seed in the ground, one apple seed, you get a tree that has eventually hundreds of apples. It's about being fruitful. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But what did Jesus say? I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. See, this life, this walk with Christ is about increase increase. It doesn't mean discontent. No, you can be content, but live a life of increase. As a follower of Jesus, we're not designed or meant to live a small life. And that's not in comparison to anybody else. We live as according to the measure of faith that God has given each one of us. But it's about increase because God's plan is bigger. It's bigger than we could ever think or we could ever imagine. Also, God's plan is more rewarding. When you finally discover what your purpose and you're working in your sweet spot, there's nothing like it. I know a lady that had come to the church for a while, didn't know where to fit in, and she decided, you know, one time I got up here, or Pastor Ben got up and said, hey, we need some more helpers in the children's church area and kids' ministry. And she was like, well, I, you know... Maybe, maybe I could do that. And she was just responding to filling a spot. You know, we had a need, and she jumped in. And it wasn't long before she discovered her sweet spot. She realized that she loved influencing that little group of kids around her, knowing that maybe her influence would shape uh, the minds and the hearts of that next generation. So when she started, she couldn't wait to get to church. Instead of just coming and thinking, well, I, I hope I hear a good sermon, Pastor Mike. No, she couldn't wait because she knew she was going to be an influence that morning. Oh, my. She, it was more than just filling a spot. That's why it's so important to jump on a C team, serve somewhere, because, wow, that's how you're going to grow. And that's, that's how you're going to understand that God's plan is bigger for you than you could ever imagine. It's, it's bigger and it's more rewarding but also, let me say this too, that God's plan is also going to be most likely more difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. No joke. <laughs> There'll be times where you will scratch your head like, what in the world are you doing, God? I don't understand. I think I made a wrong turn somewhere. And you won't understand why till you get to the other side of it because sometimes it's going to be more difficult. Think about Mary, sweet little Mary here, you know. I mean, she faced nine months of gossip and rumors because she was a virgin, but she was pregnant. Nine months of criticism. I have a hard time if somebody posts something negative about me or the church. I'm like, I'm living with that for days. Or 10 of you could come up to me after this service and say, Pastor, my great sermon, but I hear one person, and they kind of struggle with this or that, and boy, I'll, be, I'll be focused on that. It's kind of the way we are sometimes, right? She faced nine months of gossip. Now that takes some. That's, that's, I don't know, that takes something. She wasn't so fragile and insecure like sometimes we are, so easily offended. 
And not only that, the day before she delivered the baby, she had to get on a donkey and take a long journey. Think about that. All you, all you mamas out there, what would that be like, huh? I mean, you, even the, the, getting a ride to the hospital today with a car that has the best suspension of all. Like, remember those Lincoln Town cars back in the 70s? Those big boats? Man, you never felt the bumps. You just, you were like going down the road like this, man. It was such a smooth ride. Hey, that would even be too tough, right? Here she had to get on a donkey and take a long journey to Bethlehem the day before she delivered. And she had to deliver it all by herself. Well, with Joseph there and a bunch of barnyard animals, but her mom wasn't there. Her sisters weren't there. Her aunties weren't there. I mean, sometimes God's plan, again, you may not understand it. You may ask a thousand whys, and you may not understand it until you get to the other side of it. But sometimes it's more difficult. And why is that? So the third thing that we need to remember is this. When God changes your plans, it means that he wants you to learn to trust him more. Not to trust in others. You know, the Bible doesn't say that we should trust completely in people. It doesn't. I mean, I've often taught, even in marriage context, that, you know, trust is the foundation of a relationship. I've kind of reconsidered that. I think really love is. God tells us, he doesn't tell us to trust people. He tells us to love people. And love is going to, a component of love is trustworthiness. You see, how can I ask you to trust me if I can't even trust myself? Sometimes to do the right thing, to say the right thing. It's going to lead to a life of disappointment. We're to trust in the Lord. And that's what the Bible says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't depend on your own understanding, but in all your ways seek Him and He will show you which path to take. See, God's plan for their life was so, was so unusual, it was was difficult and it was so different that all they could really do was trust God. That's all they knew to do. I was talking with a lady who uh, she was caretaking her husband as he was going through cancer treatments. Somebody that you would know. And uh, it's tough to be a caretaker too, as well as those that are getting re- treatment. And she said one day, she said this, sometimes you don't know God is all you need until he's all you've got. Isn't that true? You see, sometimes challenge, difficulty, God disciplines us, doesn't he? He allows us as a good father to feel the consequences of our decisions like any good parent would do. You don't bail your kids out for everything. God tests us. God allows, doesn't always, doesn't cause, but he allows pain and suffering to teach us. You know what I've discovered is pain and suffering, it really humbles me to know that I'm not all that humbles me to know that this body isn't going to last forever, (laughs) that it's going to break down someday. uh, You know, today I I see in part, but someday you and I will be complete. But until we get there, there's a lot of brokenness. There's struggle. There's difficulty. And look what this verse says. My suffering was good for me because it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. You, You disciplined me because I needed it. See, it's sometimes, and Paul never shied away from talking about suffering for the, for the sake of the gospel because it became his ministry. I don't care what kind of experience you've had. Maybe God didn't cause it, but your response is key. Well, you may say, how can a, how can a financial collapse, having to declare bankruptcy, how, how can that be good for me? I know the Bible says, you know, and we know God causes, uses everything to work together for the good. How can that be good? How can having someone commit unfaithfulness and, and have an affair on me, how can that be good? How can that baby that we miscarried, how, how can that turn out for good? When you're going through it, I don't, I don't know what good you could maybe come up with out of that. 
but maybe it's a few years down the road when another young lady experiences that and now you know exactly what she felt and now that miscarriage is turning into a miracle because now you can come alongside that young lady and and now that mess becomes a miracle now now see God wastes nothing God will turn everything everything to good and it becomes a way for you to be effective and influential and to have a ministry. But to get through that, to get to the other side, you got to get to the other side. Don't get stuck in the mess. you got to get to the miracle. That's surrender. That's accountability. That's having people walk alongside. You can't do it alone. But get to the other side. Don't get stuck because then it turns into a ministry really comes down to, am I going to trust God or trust me? Here's three warning signs as I close here this morning of when you're not really trusting God. Here's what it says. Fatigue. You're exhausted. You're trusting in yourself. You're just exhausted. You're just frazzled. You're doing everything. You're not really asking for help or when somebody does help you, you're like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, I got it. I got it. I got it. And you're just exhausted. You're fatigued. And you know what happens when you get fatigued. You get frustrated. Your plans aren't coming out as you thought they would. Your plans are frustrated. Now you're irritable. Now you're agitated. Now you're just, and you know what? Unfortunately, the people sometimes closest to you bear the brunt of this frustration that you carry because you haven't been trusting God like you should. And then when things aren't working out, we start to think, man, the future doesn't look too good. And we live in fear. And then we start to worry and we're filled with anxiety. See, that's why we need a Savior. That's why God had to send a solution because He knows we can't make it on our own. We needed a Savior. You needed a Savior. You need a Savior to forgive you of your sins, first of all. You need a a Savior for eternity. You need a Savior for your purpose, for you to find your sweet spot, for you to experience the satisfaction and of work, of living in your sweet spot. There's a hundred reasons why we need a Savior. Otherwise, we deal with all these kind of emotions, depression, loneliness, fear, all kinds of things because we haven't learned to trust God. Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever received the gift of salvation? Have you received the gift of Jesus today? Would you consider that? See, it's like this. If you came to me and you gave me just a beautifully wrapped Christmas present, and I took it and I received it, and I just put it under the tree, and I never opened it, A month later, maybe after the new year, you come up to me and say, Pastor Mike, how did you like my gift I gave you? And I say, oh, you know what? I, Man, I got just so busy. I haven't even opened it yet. You'd be like, what? You haven't even opened the gift I gave you? I'd be like, well, I'm sure it was a very good gift, but I just was so busy. Do you know that millions of people will celebrate Christmas and they've never opened up the gift? Why do we put up the lights? Why do we exchange gifts? When we've not received the gift of all gifts, would you receive the gift that God has sent you in the form of His Son? Would you receive Him today? Why not celebrate this Christmas like never before, knowing the true meaning because you've experienced it. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? And if you're here today and you'd say, I know about the gift. I've been around church or I've, you know, I celebrate Christmas. I know about, you know, Christmas. It's really not about Santa. It's about God, you know, Jesus. I, I, I've heard that before. Maybe you haven't, but many of us have. But you've never received that gift and you never have opened it up. You know about it, but you haven't opened it up. Why don't you pray this prayer with me today from your heart. Say the words you want to say, but let me give you some ideas. 
just pray this. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this gift of Christmas now, this gift that you have given me, and I, I don't want to reject it. I don't want to put it aside because I'm too busy. I, I want to receive that gift, so I open up my hands. Right now, I open up my hands to receive that gift. I open up my heart to you. I know inside there, there must be more. There must be a plan that I haven't really gotten on board with yet. And it's time. I don't care if you're 8 years old or you're 80 years old. It's not too late and it's not too early to receive this gift. You watching online here right now, I receive the gift that God is giving you right now. He'll forgive you of the sins. Maybe you could pray that right now. God, forgive me of my sin. I know that's been an obstacle between you and me. I've felt far from you because I felt like, you know, I've, I've done so many things wrong. Forgive me of my sin. The Bible says when you simply ask him to forgive you, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Guess what? That gift is yours. You can look up now. I trust you've prayed that prayer. Maybe for the first time or maybe, you know, You've chucked God for a while, and this is a time for you to come back and receive Him. Welcome back to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. It's awesome. And now for those of you who need to trust Him more, and for those of you who you know that He deserves your attention, will you surrender? Will you understand that, yes, He has a bigger and better plan Will you understand that he wants you to go with his plan and not your own? And will you learn to trust him more? I pray you take this message to heart today. Why don't you stand with me? And we're going to sing this. I need to really let you go so the next crowd can come in. So let me just pray a prayer blessing over here, and we'll sing this as we go. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you, Lord, for this gift of Jesus. We receive it now. And God, we just thank you, God, that you're going to help us now with whatever we're going through. You love us. You care for us. You have our best interest in mind. So we go in the strength and power of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.